Hi, I'm Tim Spann, developer advocate at Stream Native. My talk today is let's keep it simple and streaming. So I've been working with various streaming technologies for a number of years, and my background in Spring goes back to the days uh, where I worked at Pivotal, working with Spring and Cloud Foundry, Hadoop, and lots of cool stuff a number of years ago. Great time there. I worked at Cloudera, Hortonworks, and a bunch of other companies in the streaming space, covering everything from IoT to machine learning, Java, big data, lots of different technologies, especially focused around streaming, fast data, getting data where it needs to go, wherever that may be as quick as possible. And we've got a big announcement. Uh, we have a spring connector for Apache Pulsar. Thanks to uh, the community out there in streaming and a number of people at VMware and people at uh, Stream Native. It's out there. It's pretty awesome. It is uh, some great libraries. And thanks to uh, some people from Datastax worked on the reactive one. This is a robust set of libraries. We'll go through it, but it's pretty awesome. You might be going, what's Apache Pulsar? Well, Apache Pulsar is everywhere, and we'll show you why. And we'll go into a number of reasons why it's a pretty cool thing to be combining with Spring. Let's go through our agenda. We've got a decent amount of time here. So for once, I'm not rushed. It's not like trying to get an entire uh, system in 20 minutes, 15 minutes. We've got time. Uh, so we'll do the introduction. I'll tell you what Apache Pulsar is. Show you different ways we can interact with some Spring apps. Show you how I can connect Spring via the Pulsar protocol, via the AMQP RabbitMQ protocol, via the MQTT protocol, Kafka protocol. Do some demos, show some code, and hopefully set you up for wanting to start using Spring with Pulsar. And you can use JDK 17 or whatever uh, new JDK you like. Apache Pulsar is pretty amazing. It is growing really fast. Community is large, very vibrant and growing. Over 500 contributors and committers to the project, which is a lot. There's over 7,000 people active on our Slack. Definitely join up, see what's going on, especially if you have questions or you want to see what's going on. It is very busy project. It is definitely not, uh, you know, uh, not growing. The growth is fast. Number of commits is massive. Tons of people using it. Tons of organizations. We passed a thousand different organizations using Pulsar out there. So definitely something you got to take a look at. Some of the most important things, if you're only going to take away four things about Pulsar from this talk, this is probably the four. It is one messaging platform to do everything. So you could do streaming, things you can think of like what Kinesis and Kafka do, and things you might be doing for work queues, GMS style messaging, IoT messaging. You need to get an event, a message, a bit of code, some, some bit of uh, data somewhere quickly. Uh, this is the place to do it. Your messages are gonna get there. Uh, the system is very resilient. It's designed cloud natively so things don't fail, that there's redundancy, there's separation of concerns. Uh, you separate compute and storage. And with that, you could scale it up very easily in, say, a Kubernetes environment or whatever style environment you may be using. It is designed to scale up based on that separation of compute and storage. So if you need to add more storage, you add more storage. If you just need to support more consumers, more people interacting with messages, and that can be, we'll show you how many different types of uh, consumers there are. That can be pretty big too. And you need to scale it down. You scale it up very easy because that storage is separate. It's very easy to uh, spin things up and down without having to worry about losing messages or slowing things down or having difficulties there. The DevOps is pretty powerful. And what's cool is we'll show you that even metadata is kept separately, and that could be in your standard etcd if you're in Kubernetes. So it's pretty, pretty powerful. These are 
four things that uh, should be the minimum takeaways from Pulsar. One thing that makes it pretty awesome, especially for people in spring out there that might have some apps you've written a number of years ago. Hopefully you've updated them to uh, JDK 17, latest version of spring, the newest spring boot. But you may have some older apps out there and they may have be using some older protocols, which great is. I could take that, just change my configuration, recompile, or maybe just re-deploy, uh, or maybe just change the configuration, depending on how you're getting that when you're reading that. And just point that to Pulsar, because Pulsar can accept uh, messages via a bunch of different protocols. So that makes it very easy. You already have an app that's using AMQP. Well, let's just point that to a Pulsar topic and cluster. You could use the same port. You could even use the same uh, name if you uh, use some uh, funky load balancing and just point it to a different server. Whatever is easier for you. Uh, doesn't matter to Pulsar. Pulsar will use whatever names and ports you like, as long as someone else isn't using them. And you could do that with the Pulsar native protocol, which is probably the easiest, fastest, best way. But Kafka protocol works. MQTT works, uh, Rocket MQ works, bunch of options there. So you get your data in there, use Spring Apps. You could also use regular plain Java. You could use Python, Go, uh, Rust, whatever you're happy with, C++. Lots of different libraries support there. So you get things into Pulsar, it goes into a topic. That topic can be partitioned if it needs to be, like in Kafka. But how you consume it out decides what type of stream your messaging you're doing, which is powerful. And what's nice is as many of these different apps as you want with whatever language, it could be Spring, it could be Java, it could be Python, it could be Spark, Flink, NiFi, lots of different things. They can decide how they want to get the data and decide the style of uh, consuming. And you give as many of those as you want. They get their own subscription. It's just for them. What's cool is you don't have to worry about that. You decide that when you uh, subscribe. And the server, because it's not you know, too busy with doing storage, because that's separated concerns, it will track where you are for you. So you never lose messages. And you never lose your space in the line. And you've got your own dedicated subscription. Have as many of those as you want. As many topics as you want. You need a million topics, you got a million topics, no problem. So let's go through the list here, how these apps divide up. So key shared, pretty cool. I like to use this for CDC and I'll have the key be tied to of the table name. So you could have one particular uh, subscription that goes for that key. So you can have dedicated consumer for that subscription. That's similar to uh way Kafka does it. And you could use a Kafka a library if you want to use that. Failover, I've got a dedicated consumer to that particular subscription for that particular topic. And he's the only one can read it. If that consumer dies, uh, failover is going to take over for you and continue where you are. No lost messages, no slowdown. Very nice way to do that. Uh, that's a production smart way to do it. Now, maybe you're not doing streaming. Uh, you could do exclusive, which could be used for both, but uh, you tend to use it for messaging. Exclusive, only one consumer can get to that particular subscription for that topic. So no one else can. This is a good way to keep other apps out, keep things in an order. Only one consumer. When they stop, we'll pause it there. That uh, wherever your pointer is, it is sitting there. And uh, you start up again when you want or leave that as long as you want, start a new subscription somewhere else. Uh, the one thing to note is we don't really want to delete uh, data or have it expire or delete a topic if you needed to do that until you uh, finish your subscription here. It's kind of like you get a magazine and we're going to keep sending it to you if you paid us, you know, that sort of thing. Now, shared is traditional messaging. Uh, whoever gets it, everyone shares the subscription. We all share it. It's the old days of Netflix. All your friends had one subscription. You all shared it. And you get what you get. You come in. Whoever gets the first message gets it. You know, there's no ordering. 
There's no, uh, you have no idea who's going to get what, when. You just want to get these messages processed as fast as possible. This is a great way to do a work queue. You could have 10,000 consumers, share one subscription, messages as fast as they come in, you process them. Great way to distribute uh, work and jobs, that sort of thing. Shared is pretty cool. Now, one thing that makes it the unified platform and makes this make more sense, you're going to have a ton of subscriptions, is the ability to have multi-tenancies. So you have a cluster out there. Under there, you, you set up a bunch of different tenants. Now, these can be different companies. This can be different uh, groups within your company, different applications. Whatever makes sense for you, it's logical. But again, it's tied to security. It's tied to scalability. There's a lot of reasons you do this. So say I set a tenant up for data services under there, could set up as many namespaces as I want. Again, this could be sub apps, this could be different groups, individual developers, How, whatever makes sense for you. Say we got the microservices one, and then under there, I'll create individual topics and I'll create a uh, hundred thousand topics under there. You know, whatever makes sense for you, how you want to break them up. Maybe that's all the tables from one particular database. However, that maps to your data, that's up to you. What's nice is that gives you uh, a lot of naming freedom because tenant namespace topic is the full unique part. So, you know, you don't have to come up with these insanely long names if you had only a single tenant cluster. You don't have to run hundreds of different clusters to keep things separate. Everything under each uh, namespace is secure. So you could lock people to a specific tenant, a specific namespace, specific topic, wherever you want to do security. And this scales out. This can be replicated around the world. Pretty powerful. Now, what is the data we send around? We call it a message. You call a lot of different things, but that is the typical term. And there's a couple of important pieces in here. As you might expect, there's the value, the data payload. And this is basically what you want to send around. This is your record, your row, your data. Uh, all of them, though, are raw bytes. So this means if I want to put an image in there, if I want to put part of an encrypted thing in there, something that's compressed, you know, break things up, you, you encode, mime encode, whatever you want to put in there, you put it in there. Now, getting it out, you know, we recommend if it is going to be tabular data, if it looks, smells like a database, put a schema on there. And I'll show you how you could do that. So, you know, you don't have to worry if you want to put a PDF in there. Or on the other hand, you want to put a JSON record or Avro or table record, something that's very structured, semi-structured. We'll show you how to make that easy. Now, keys are optional. They probably shouldn't be. We're being too nice here. I mean, for some use cases, people just get messages and, you know, it's not that important. Uh, that's the one uh, couple of the features we have. You really need to push data through the system and maybe only sample it. You could do things like not have a key. You could also turn off persistence. Uh, by default, every topic is persistent, so we're not going to lose that data. But maybe it's data like you have some device somewhere that's just peeping, peeping, constantly saying, okay, okay, okay. And you don't really want every single one of those records. It happens a thousand times a second. You've got 10,000 of those. It's just empty records of no value. Maybe you sample it once a minute, once an hour, put it into a topic there where you care about it, put a key on it and a timestamp. But for these constant beeps, you might not care. So maybe then you don't need a key. But if you want this data, Key is very important. It helps us partition the data for performance. Helps when we want to compact things, again, for performance. Helps make things findable. You know, I could do a key value lookup using the new table uh, view API. I could use it if I want to track the data through the system. I get the key as soon as it enters the topic. Whoever consumes it has that key. I'm trying to debug something or track data through a system or do auditing. Just add a key, please. I'll show you that in the system. Properties, sometimes you've got some data that may change or may be specific to uh, one consumer or producer. Add it in a property. Key value map there. This does not change your payload 
which is nice. You have this extra data coming around with you. This may be every time you get a stop, again, for auditing or for some other validation. Every time you get to a, a stop, you know, it's the first consumer, add a property, send it to the next topic, move along the chain, wherever you want to do it there. Nice to have. Put a producer name in there. If you don't, we'll give it a generated name. Might be hard for you to track things down. You want, again, be able to audit, find out what's going on without too much difficulty. Put a nice producer name in there to make everything easy for you. Sequence ID, you don't have control over this. This is how we know things are in order. So when it arrives, it gets an ID. So we know the order of the messages. So if you want them in order, you want them exactly once, we could do that for you, which is very nice. So I was talking about the cluster splitting up the uh, how it handles things, which makes sense. So the Pulsar brokers, and these are what we call those servers or nodes, you know, whether they're pods, containers, bare metal servers, however you might want to do this. We call them brokers. You know, they're brokering your data. This handles the messaging routing, all those connections. Doesn't store state. Again, cheaper nodes. So you don't have to have a big SSD disk on there, which is nice. Get as many of these as you want. Obviously, so there's some caching in there where it makes sense. Uh, this does automatic load balancing. Important if you get big jumps in the amount of data comes through the system and all the topics coming in here broken up into multiple segments it just does that which is great now it has some metadata it's going to need it's going to need to find some services what else is in the cluster we have a separate uh, server for that and you can have a couple of these if you're in the hadoop world or traditional you could use zookeeper you're in Kubernetes, you probably want to use that etcd you have there anyway. Do it on your laptop or in small scale for maybe dev or trying things out. Use RocksDB. Um, it's an open, open source API there. So anyone who wants to write their own metadata storage engine, follow the API, add it to the system, you're ready to go. So we store metadata for both Pulsar and Bookkeeper, do all the service discovery. And as you can see, when we store messages, Pulsar communicates with Apache Bookkeeper, which is a separate storage node. And this is not just a flat log file on a disk somewhere. This is a pretty advanced data storage system. We call these node bookies. So you got your brokers and your bookies. Uh, these servers are going to store the message and store our cursor. The cursor tells me where everyone is in their subscriptions. So you don't have to remember that as a developer somewhere on your app. And if you lose that, you're in trouble. Server stores that persistently. So we always know where you are. So if we geo-replicate you somewhere else, you'll continue where you were. Really nice feature, especially when you're dealing with massively distributed systems where parts of this may be running in different availability zones, different uh, clouds, different uh, servers, uh, different small devices. Pulsar can run in a pretty small space. Some people will run this on a small box, do what you have to do, and then use geo-replication, get to a bigger box somewhere. Maybe in your organization, you've got a lot of little servers or little machines sitting you know, in different offices or in uh, devices, say an ATM, and they'll talk to some central thing in a uh, local network. And then maybe we'll geo-replicate there to a, uh, a local edge server. And then from there, maybe you hop to uh, the local uh, closest cloud uh, availability zone. And then maybe to a central one. As many hops as you need, not a problem. But Bookkeeper is doing that storage. It is grouping them into segments and ledgers. And these put these uh, segments together in an ensemble and stores them and they're restored redundantly, you don't lose data. It's a, it's a fast but smart storage engine. Scales well, but you know this, this is the place you might be using SSDs, more storage and faster uh, disk. And again, anything where we're doing uh, clustered computers, fast network, kind of critical. But if you're running in the cloud, you already have that, but you get the idea. So it's pretty easy idea. 
Producer is who publishes the data. You know, this is probably your Spring Boot app. It's getting whatever data it has, and then it's going to send it to Pulsar. Doesn't know who's going to consume it how. And it could be a lot of people doing it a lot of different ways. Doesn't matter. I decide the topic, decide if I want to send it sync or async. You know, do I want to wait till the message goes through? And then I get acknowledgement that it happened. I pick my topic or pick my uh, topic and partition, get it into Pulsar. Pulsar handles all the communication and then your job as producer is done. Again, if you're concerned about tracking, you've got that key there. It could be looked up later, whether you want to do something like the table view, you want to have a listener subscribe to it, you want to do a query against the Pulsar current topic data via something like Trino. Trino has a nice connection there where I could do SQL against that topic and see what's there. Again, great for auditing and some other things. Uh, Spring also has some interceptors and I'll show you one of those to show you what happens after a message happens. Again, good for auditing or just for uh, your own purposes when you're developing. So we got it into the topic and it can wait there forever. You can also set it to timeout based on the amount of time or disk space. And you can also set it up to go to tiered storage. So say you have something that says, when I hit a petabyte and it's older than a month, start sending those older records into tiered storage and it'll do it for you automatically built into the open source. And that could be Hadoop, could be S3, it could be ADLS V2, could be Google Cloud Storage, could be uh, Minio, lots of options there. Again, open API, open source. You've got some other place you wanna put it, why don't you do it? Just write that code. There's uh, The community is very welcoming of new ideas, new code, new features. We are growing. We are not locked down. It's not run by one company. It's a great community of people. So maybe you have another Spring Boot app or it could be Spark, could be Flink, could be Go, Rust, Python, C++, C Sharp, REST, WebSockets. Lots of options there. So you have a consumer. They set up a subscription. Maybe the subscription is unique for that particular consumer. And they subscribe to a topic or topic and partition. And they get the data when it comes in. Event at a time. Lots of different ways to listen to that subscription. Push, pull, however you want to do it. You do it in a key value kind of way. Whatever makes sense for your application. They don't know who produced it. Now you can get that information, you can get that producer name, but again, you have that uh, that disconnect, that asynchronicity that makes it really nice for you. You don't have to care where that data came from, what protocol it used, how it arrived. You just know you get it and you get it when you need it, which is awesome. Now we mentioned this before, but try to show you a little more on this messaging versus streaming, not exactly the same. What's nice is if you decide to mix and match, you could do that with Pulsar, even with the same topic, which is nice. Uh, Q again, work queues, you wanna get tasks done, don't care about order. Uh, you may wanna just get as many people consuming it as possible. Streaming, and that's your traditional one in Hadoop and big data, Kafka Kinesis idea here is, I get messages, I get events happen. I wanna process them in order. I wanna process them exactly once or at least once. Do it as fast as possible. Maybe the data is partitioned so I could have multiple consumers consuming it at once. Or we do something like the key shared where you're doing it that way. You want it fast. These are really cool apps and I like writing these. And you could do that with Pulsar. Now we mentioned these different subscription modes. Uh, you'll get these slides. You can go back in case you have some, some uh, questions on the difference between exclusive and failover. For most use cases, I wouldn't use exclusive. I just use failover because it gives you all the benefits of exclusive plus you know, that backup of things go uh, haywire. But depends on your application type, what you're doing in the real world there. Again, this is how you get the guaranteed order. When I do shared, a lot of people are consuming at once. Uh, it may come in order. 
it, good luck. You don't know. It's it, whoever gets it first, whoever can run faster. So that's a great way to see a lot of data pumped through the system. He shared, we split the difference. I kind of like that one a lot. If you have some kind of key that divides up your data logically, that's awesome. That's a very common case, like I said, CDC. But there's other systems where you might want to process everything from a particular server, particular region, state, city type of data. You know, I've got orders for bacon, steak, and uh, chicken. Maybe that's my key. So all bacon data goes to the bacon consumer. All steak data goes to the other one, all in one topic. Again, you could also break things up into separate topics. You're not going to run out of topics. You could support millions of them, and there's people running a lot of topics. Some people create topics on the fly as they come in based on what the data is. So you could have that flexibility. Data looks a little different. You could change it. Pretty nice. Many topics you want. You don't have to worry about it. Don't have to worry about running out of names or have to make weird shortened names with lots of numbers in them because you have, you know, 1 million topics under one single tenant. We have multi-tenants. Create a new tenant. Create a new namespace. Put as many as you want under there. Pretty cool. Now, getting the data is pretty easy. The uh, PubSub API is very flexible, pretty easy to use. If we're going to do a uh, shared consumer, create a consumer, put your topic in there. Usually the topic will have persistent, colon, forward, forward, tenant name, namespace name, topic name. Now, if I don't say that, the default impulsor is persistent, public default. Public is the tenant that's always there, unless you delete it or lock it down. Default is the default namespace under that tenant. Obviously, if you're doing development, maybe it doesn't matter, or you're spinning something up, running it for a couple of minutes and then dropping it, then you don't care. But once you're in production, you probably want to specify your tenants and namespaces. And that can be done in the spring configuration. That can be done in a couple different places. So you don't have these giant strings everywhere up to you. Give yourself a unique subscription name. If you share a subscription, you will be sharing that topic and that data depending on your subscription type, it may perform differently than you expect. Here we're doing shared, and I give it this subscription name. So all the different consumers that are using that uh, subscription name are going to consume at once. And once I subscribe, the data is just going to start streaming in. Now, if I want to do the failover version, pretty much the same thing. I just pick a different subscription type, and those are just in there when you uh, set up the library, very easy to do. If we ever add a new one, that'll show up in the new version of the library. Again, like I said, this is nice. If you're running a consumer, maybe you've got two servers, one's running the consumer and one you have failover in case you got a, something crashes or you wanna switch, or maybe the failover is in a different cloud and all of a sudden Google Cloud is cheaper for this hour. Maybe I'll stop one, let it fail over to the next one. Doesn't affect you other than that slight blip while we flip it over. Now we could do everything in the world with Spring and I'm very happy there. Like I said, I worked at Pivotal. I love Spring. I love uh, what the Josh Long and the team are doing. Pretty cool stuff. But we've got support for a lot of other stuff, which means I can write my Spring Boot app and talk to anyone else's app. And I don't have to, you know, make some kind of changes to my code so that we can communicate with each other. I can use uh, Pulsar to do that for me. And I can pick my protocol. I can pick the native Pulsar one, or I could do Kafka, MQTT, or AMQP. What's nice as well is we don't just have them as those full featured protocol handlers. They'll also show up in the sources and syncs. So if you want to keep a Kafka cluster somewhere in an MQTT cluster and a Rabbit cluster, I could have Pulsar be your main messaging and make uh, a slice of that data go over to them, whether a partial stream or a full stream, and keep them all in sync automatically for you if you need to do that. Now, client libraries, obviously, Pulsar is written in Java, so Java is our main 
our main library, and that one will get all the new features first. It's probably the most performant, but the C++ and Go ones are kind of ridiculously fast. Also support for Python as first class. Spring, again, we just got that approved, obviously sitting on top of uh, the Java libraries, but uh, using Spring makes it a lot easier. Node.js is a nice client. We've got HTTP one out there for REST. We mentioned Go, C Sharp, Scala. WebSocket one is pretty cool. Whatever language you have that does WebSockets, including a simple web page, can consume and produce messages to Pulsar, which is nice. So you got, there's also more, but these are, these are the main languages that have libraries out there. Some people have written their own. Connectors for pretty much everything you need, whether it's uh, different things in Google or Amazon or Microsoft, things like Delta Lake and Iceberg and Hootie are pretty cool ones. Silly DB, ton of different stuff here. And what's nice is you can also use the Kafka Connect connectors. So that gives you a ton of them. And then uh, functions are cool. Uh, we They don't currently support Spring. Uh, they're pretty simple and don't really need it. Uh, these lightweight stream processors, and this is not placement for Flink or Spark or anything like that. These are little functions that you don't have to do much work in. Again, I usually write them in Java or Python. You write a function, you pat, it gets in, you subscribe it to one or more topics. You don't have to write any of the Pulsar code now. What's nice is I deploy this function. I do some mapping. It automatically gets events when they pop into a topic. You do whatever you want in there. Maybe uh, convert the data from one type to another, change a schema, do a lookup, maybe do something like NLP, something lightweight. You know, maybe I'm enriching it in one step. It's very easy. And then the output goes to another topic. Again, you could have Spring Boot, get the data, put it into a topic. A function does something. Maybe it parses it into different uh, topics, different subtypes, and then it's available later. I do that in the application and I'll show you that. When you wanna do stream processing, fast processing, got a lot of options out there like Flink and Spark. You can automatically connect it to Lambda. Trino and Presto let you do uh, queries on the data. Now there is a difference. Flink does continuous queries. Trino and Presto run a query and complete based on what's in the topic this second. So if data, expires out or goes to uh, tiered storage or is deleted, uh, you won't see that change. You get your result, and that's what you got, but that's like a SQL database. So it gives you a way to use standard JDBC drivers to get to the data if you wanna see moment in time data. Also, because we have that tiered storage and we can support a lot of data, petabytes of data, you can use this as a database, a simple database using a powerful Trino engine to do it. And it's pretty nice if the data is in that local bookkeeper storage or it's been tiered out, doesn't matter. It'll just get it for you. You can get back to the first message you ever put in the system if you want to. Pretty cool. And to get that tiered storage, we've got a number of data offloaders and there's some more. Again, open API, very easy to, to uh, contribute in the open source. Always looking for new contributors. If you've got your own storage system you'd like to add, API is pretty simple. Write it in Java and you're ready to go. Now, when we mention these different protocol handlers, these are not a sidecar. You know, sidecar, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. It's not some kind of proxy that does some kind of conversion for you and tries to change the protocol. The way Pulsar was designed is it has a flexible plugin protocol handler. And as long as you implement that interface, so it makes sense for Spring people, uh, it's identical. So there's one, that's how Pulsar one is written. And that's how the one for Kafka is written. So it's a full Kafka protocol implementation. And it talks to Pulsar on the other end, just as the Pulsar protocol handler does. So it doesn't matter how you got data into the system. It's just regular Pulsar data, which makes it really easy for you to get it out a different way. So I produced it with the Pulsar library. I could consume it out with the Kafka library, mix and match. I could have subscriptions for a Pulsar consumer, 
Kafka Consumer, WebSockets, MQTT, uh, AMQP, REST, whatever makes sense, which is really nice. The full power of everything else goes into standard Pulsar topics with all that managed ledger storage, load balancing, geo-replication, no problem. Doesn't matter the protocol, same thing for MQTT. We have that full uh, implementation there. Also, this one shows you the optional proxy. You don't have to have a proxy to do it, but it's uh, it's something you could add. Uh, there's a lot of uh, options within the Pulsar, depending on how you want to consume it. Depends how big your clusters are. Uh, depends how you're doing uh, storage and stuff. Same thing for the uh, Rabbit. And again, you use all the native libraries you were using before. Again, you could take your existing Brownfield apps, repoint them to Pulsar, or have the load balancer or your networking administrator change what that uh, points to. So maybe your Rabbit server was Rabbit1 on 5678. Just point that to Pulsar in the load balancer and just keep going. You might not have to recompile. You might want to recompile. And then once you've been doing it in a while, maybe update to the Pulsar library, but you don't have to. So one of those features I mentioned before is, yeah, it's all bytes and you're like, uh, we're all binary data. That's a pain. Do I have to handle all the stuff on both ends of that? Well, fortunately you don't. We've got a schema registry built into Pulsar. You don't have to run something on the side. You don't need the third party thing. It handles the schemas for you and supports all the major ones. Again, open source. You want to add new ones, very easy to do it. People have done it. More the merrier. Avro, protobuf, json, string. Uh, you pick a schema. When you produce it, if there's no schema there yet, it's going to build one for you. So in Spring Boot, that makes it pretty nice. I create a regular Java bean, maybe put some annotations on it data types I want, it will generate a schema of the type I chose when it gets pushed. And if you change it, it'll version it for you. And your data will be serialized per that specific schema. It's great. And it's cached if it doesn't change, all that performance stuff. And then when you're consuming it on the other end, based on the topic, it can look it up. Again, there's REST and API and DevOps. If you want to manually grab things like the schema or check where it is, all that's available for you pretty easy. So when you're using the Spring Boot consumer, it's going to look up the schema, get it, and deserialize it the right way. You get your right object back. Really nice. Does all the magic for you. You don't have to, there's, there's no difficulty there. It just does it for you. And I'll show you that in a code. Really easy. That is a nice feature. Now, when I'm building real-time apps, got a team of different things work together. Obviously, Spring, great for running apps. Sometimes you need something to get some of the data in play. We'll use Apache NiFi over there in uh, on the left. Spring, uh, Apache Pulsar sit in the middle, you know, acting as the universal data hub for everything. Get it in, get it out, share it with all your friends. Flink on the uh, right. It's just my favorite uh, logo ever, but a great way to do continuous analytics, uh, do things like real-time SQL, very easy, deploys easy, and scales massively. If you haven't heard about Apache Flink, you will. A lot going on there. My buddy Scylla, they've got a great uh, library for Spring. I use that sometimes to, uh, to use it for caching of my local data, key value lookups. It's a great data store. Delta Lake, I might want a very large uh, lake house. Very easy for Pulsar to just send my spring data there for me. And maybe I'm doing ETL or machine learning with Spark. Again, when you're building real-time apps, you tend to have to use a couple things. It makes it easier. Like Spring does some things awesome. Pulsar is a great place to message. You know, Spark's great for uh, certain types of apps lots to do there but uh today we're talking mostly pulsar with spring they work together really well the current uh documentation is available here and it's very straightforward like i said we'll walk through the two applications
but I'll show you a little bit about the code right here. This is the default code to do non-reactive spring to send a message. And this is gonna look pretty familiar to uh, spring people. It also pretty similar to the way the uh, Kafka template works. So we've got a Pulsar template. Observation is my object where the data is gonna be. This is going to be my schema. And to make it the schema, uh, it's pretty easy. Using the template set schema, I'm gonna decide I want this as a JSON schema. I could have picked Avro or Protobuf, but JSON works for my other members of the team really nice. It's very easy for me to read. You know, you, you may standardize on Avro or Protobuf or something else, but you know, especially for development, JSON is nice. So then we just point to the class, scheme is done. Pretty nice. Now, if I want to send a message synchronously, I'm going to use Pulsar template, new message, put in my instance of that class, and then I'm going to set a key, and then I'm going to send it. I get back a message ID. This message ID is that, that uh, ID we talked about before that Pulsar gave me back. So this means I sent it. Pulsar acknowledged it and gave me back the ID of that. So if you wanted to push this to ScyllaDB or a database or some in-memory thing or Redis, I can do that. If I really wanted to track all these keys, maybe I'm validating them. Maybe I'm doing a sampling of them. Go for it. You can always access the uh, message IDs of messages later, but it doesn't hurt to have it. Good for debugging. Now, when I want to consume the messages, pretty easy. Set up a listener, give it a subscription name, give it a subscription type. We talked about that. Uh, tell me what the schema type is and point to the topic. Again, you see the topic persistent, public default, but that is not the topic I'm sending the message to. This data that I'm getting and I'll show you in the app is going to the air quality topic. Well, where's what's this message over here? That's also of the same type. We'll show you that once we get to the live code. We want to configure things. Uh, I'm using the YAML. You, 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 you configure it the way you want. Spring gives you a lot of options. I think YAML's the easiest. I'm going to point to the stream native cloud using SSL. I'm going to use OAuth to log in. Got to put in a couple bits of information there to get that authentication. If you don't need that authentication, maybe you're running local. You don't have to include that. It's probably a different URL. I put a couple of uh, parameters on the producer. Here I could set that name. Here I set that topic so I don't have to pass that around. I could do the same with the listener. Keep it smaller. Showing different ways of doing things. Obviously, uh, configuring everything here is pretty easy. Now, we can batch messages uh, depending on how you want to send them to the server. Maybe your network is slow. Maybe we'll batch them together. Pulsar has a lot of features and a lot of options for you to tweak things, especially for performance. So if you look at the whole list of configuration, there are a lot of options. If you like options, you'll find options. Look at the <laughs> documentation, you'll be impressed. Okay, so sometimes I don't want to use Pulsar and I'm okay with that. You know, maybe you had existing Kafka code, so I could use Spring's Kafka library. Again, going to look familiar. Got a Kafka template. Uh, here, it's a key and the uh, value. Create it with uh, the producer factory. I get it back. Create a new record. Again, that same class. Send it to a topic. Give it that key. Send the message. Boom, we sent it. Uh, great site for examples on that. Pretty straightforward. What's nice is I just point it to Pulsar. Uh, that just works. Now the uh, Pulsar, ah, the Pulsar supports MQTT as well. We want to use that protocol. We could also use a Spring library. Again, this one's a little different. I'll show you how we set up our client and host name and port. Again, I'm pointing to Pulsar and I use a default MQTT port because Pulsar can do that. It can be any port you want. And then send the message. I set my payload. Uh, this isn't as fancy as the other ones. I'm just serializing that. Uh, uh, pretty straightforward. I don't have a schema. Set the quality of service. Say I want to retain the message and publish it. 
and it publishes it to Spring over at, via from Spring via MQTT to Pulsar. Again, another option. And if you've been doing RabbitMQ, uh, we also support AMQP. Uh, really simple template here. Put in the topic, you know, turn my uh, message into JSON and send away. Pretty straightforward. But we support all these libraries with Pulsar. And again, I recommend the, the new Pulsar native library. But if you have those apps already, you could use it. It was pretty cool that that all works. Now, we also have a reactive uh, connector here, the reactive Pulsar template. That's been worked on uh, pretty well. This has been talked about at previous spring events. It is solid, is really fast. If you're into reactive, definitely check it out. Has a lot of the same ideas and features here. Set your schema and you could send a message. What's nice is you could set, uh, using the uh, sender customizer, you can uh, do things like, how do you want to produce it? What's the producer name, timeouts? all those sort of things. A lot of nice features. I'll show you that in the code. Now for the listener, a little bit different. Same idea there, point to the topic. We do a flux, get our messages back. Here I'm just printing them out. But an important thing in Pulsar that I may not have emphasized enough is that uh, you have to acknowledge the message. Uh, if you don't acknowledge that you consume the message, it's going to be listed as unacknowledged. So I can't, if I needed to delete the topic, it's going to say, hey, you've got unacknowledged messages. I don't want people to lose them. This is how you track and tell Pulsar where you are. I finish these messages. What's nice with Pulsar is it's not all or nothing. I can skip some and those will be out there and I can go back and get them later. But acknowledge your message. I got it. I'm good. I'm done for this particular subscription. Just a point to remember. Uh, this is a typical app for me. This is all in GitHub if you want to try it out. So I have Spring Boot reading from uh, a REST endpoint, publishes to the air quality topic. I've got versions that do it with Kafka and MQTT and AMQP all going to the same cluster. Also, I've got a NiFi app that points to a different REST endpoint, sends it to a different topic. But those two topics go into one Pulsar function, which parses them out, make sure they're valid, uh, make sure they match the schema, and then it routes them to three different subtopics based on what type of air quality reading it is, whether it's PM 2.5, PM 10, or ozone readings. And then those particular topics, I often read that with a Flink SQL or Spark SQL and send it where it needs to go. But we'll also show you listening to it in Spring. When Spring gets it, I could send it to another messaging system, send it to a database. You know, there's a lot of things you could do in Spring, as you may know. Now, every week I have a newsletter. It is in a lot of different places. Uh, if you go to this link here or go to flipstackweekly.com, I do it in LinkedIn, I do it in GitHub, I put in a couple different blogging sites. And it's cool stuff. It covers Spring, open source, Java, Flink, Pulsar, NiFi, Kafka, Spark, all tons of different open source things, links to code, uh, slides, articles, videos, podcasts, whatever was cool, whatever I did is in there. If you've got suggestions or you want things for me to send out to uh, my readers, definitely contact me. Always looking for new stuff. So Spring and Pulsar, the super friends, we're going to get that demo going. And then we'll get back and show you a couple of uh, links to things and uh, be pretty fun. But before we do that, all the code is here. So if you like trying to follow along, you can pull down the code, gives you examples of what's going on, what are the requirements you need, example runs, how you could interface with Spark, how you can interface with uh, Flink. How you can see the data consumed, where the data came from. Lots of cool stuff there. Same for the reactive app. Pretty straightforward. So let's, uh, I'm going to make sure I'm still logged into my Pulsar cluster so I could show you uh, the data once we get there. And this, this is an open source manager for uh, Pulsar. 
It's pretty nice. It, it's a Spring Boot app too. <laughs> uh, I didn't write it, but it's, it is pretty nice. So let's go to uh, the examples. This is that project. I'm in IntelliJ because I like IntelliJ. Sometimes I use visual code, but or even VI. You know, what are you going to do? Uh, so the project's pretty straightforward. I've got the application YAML to where I'm going to send it. Uh, topic name. Also, where I'm getting the data from. And uh, some logging levels. So standard Spring Boot app. Uh, pretty standard. I have scheduling on here because I want to keep sending messages. So we've got uh, our main uh, standard Spring stuff. Here I'm, I got that template for Pulsar with this observation. That's my model. Now I'm putting in things to make sure it's cleaner for JSON. You know, give it the names I want with the case I want. But it's just, you know, standard uh, class here. Nothing, nothing fancy. But I don't have to write a schema for that. It'll do it for me based on that. So... Every, uh, this schedule here, which I think is uh, like one second, I set the schema. I retrieve data back from REST, get back uh, some records from that. And for each one, print it out if I, if I got uh, debugging on, get a unique UUID. I don't have any code specific key to use. So I just put something unique-ish in there. If you've got something that generates unique or you have some way you have to generate keys or uh, IDs, do that. Uh, so I use the template, send it out, set the key, boom, debug it. And then it's going to go to Pulsar. And then separate from that, I've got three readers that are going to read from those three topics that are published by that function. And the function is take reading that air quality looking at the data and splitting it up into these topics. So we could run this pretty easily, as you know, in uh, Spring Boot, pretty easy. So here we're just, uh, I have it compiled. Maybe we'll compile it again, just to show you. It's just, a, I'm using Maven. Obviously you do Gradle very easily. Uh, I'm kind of lazy, I, I should move it to Gradle, but Maven is fine. So I'm just gonna do a Spring Boot run, standard Spring Boot. Next version, I'll put it into uh, Spring Native, but that's coming. So it is starting to send data. And if we pause here, uh, you could see a message ID. That is the human readable version of the message ID. And that gives you everything it needs to know to be able to find that. There's a binary version that you use if you want to do a lookup or move your data, your pointer to it. If you see here, I've got an interceptor. On a producer, I got to show you that. And here you could see that this is one of the listeners. And we've got, see, there's the ozone one, PM25. So you got different listeners there. So that's a bunch of data. We could stop that. It'll shut down the consumers properly. If we go back here, I forgot to show you uh, the interceptor, which is a nice feature of the library. So I've got one for logging that's on the producer. And I'm just going to, uh, when the acknowledgement has been sent, uh, I'm going to grab the schema and make sure it's it's a valid schema. Then I'm just going to output this. I could send this to a database. I could do maybe some logic on this. If the schema doesn't look right or if the schema changed, notify someone, message looks weird here, but it's just showing you the art of the possible, just logging it, but you could audit it, whatever you want to do here. But you got the producer name. We got that message ID. We got the key when it was published, uh, the name of the, the, of the schema. We could put out the entire schema body if you wanted, and you could output all the value of the message. That's a nice feature there. Pretty cool. But as you see here, when we, when we're running the listener, in the app here, you see here, PM25, PM10, ozone, payload, headers. And you can see that coming in down here, payload. That's that model. That's just the uh, two string method running. And then we can see the headers here. And you can see all the different headers that are coming through that you could access in spring if you wanted to do something with them. 
you know, producer name, language. This is one of the properties I manually set. Schema version, raw data, bunch of bunch of stuff may come in handy to you. As you can see here, what the real name of the topic is. By default, every topic in Pulsar has one partition. And that partition is going to be partition zero because we start counting from zero because we're in computers. Um, but you don't have to know about that. You just deal with this. But if you if you wanted to look at partitions or if you added more partitions later, that's how it would happen. And we've got a timestamp there. Pretty straightforward. Now for the uh, reactive one, let's look at the code before we run it. This one I'm not doing as much. It's a pretty simple app, but uh, we'll take a look. So we've got a reactive application with the command line runner. Got a Pulsar client linked. I got the uh, template there. I'm just doing strings on this one. Set a string schema. And here I'm just sending uh, 20 rows of data every uh, second uh, with those producers. And in the config, points to all those config files we had. And we you know what server you're connecting to. Get that URL, log in if we need to. And then we just send the data. Uh, pretty straightforward here. And then for listening, here's the uh, listener. Now to send messages, I'm using the Java Faker library just to generate some realish looking uh, JSON data just to send it. Pretty, pretty straightforward. But let's run that one. Uh, you may see a lot of messages here. Uh, there's some libraries that aren't available on my platform, and it will complain about that based on uh, some security and networking stuff on my version of the Mac M1, which is M1's great and not great. You, you probably know that. So you can see here, here's the client config where we were. We started up here. We can see uh, one of the streams received here. That is uh, a record that was auto-generated. That's not a real credit card. It's not a real stock price, but it, it's realistic looking data, which is nice, but it's an easy way to run these uh, systems pretty straightforward. Again, the spring uh, air quality one's more developed because we've got more stuff going on here, but uh, pretty straightforward to run that. Now, if we take a look at the uh, Pulsar Manager, I could see all the people who've subscribed to it, what type of subscription, and how many messages are in their backlog. So, you know, I they haven't read them yet. If I wanted to create a new subscription, I could do that. You can see this one's up to date. Uh, these others are pretty far behind. Now, if I knew they weren't going to read them anymore. I could just unsubscribe them or clear them or just, you know, get rid of them just so, you know, they're done. You know, if you don't care about them anymore. Uh, that's up to you. Uh, you could also see the storage behind, see all the different segments and ledgers of data there and where all the cursors are. So where someone is for their reading position, how many messages aren't acknowledged, pretty cool stuff. All this available via REST and command line. If you want to automate this or do some stuff on there, set all different policies on this stuff. Pretty cool. Uh, the one in... That Stream Native has in their cloud has a little more features and a message viewer and all that, but you get the idea. This is a pretty easy way to run this in the open source, and this as well as a Spring Boot app. Uh, from here, we've got some resources, a bunch of different articles that came out from the Spring team and uh, uh, the Stream Native team, a bunch of different libraries that I used here today. We have a free, completely free PDF book written by my friend David. Apache Pulsar in action, scan this, get a very large 700 plus page PDF book. Everything you want to know about Pulsar is in there. It's a great way to get started. If you want to talk to me, have some ideas for apps or just questions, uh, scan my code there or go to my LinkedIn or go to my Twitter as long as Twitter is still there. Go to my GitHub, lots of examples, lots of code out there. I hope you enjoyed my talk. If you have any questions, definitely reach out. Thanks again.